Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Could I ask you please to take your seats? My name is David Myers, and I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of the Center for Jewish History. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's event uh, titled History Matters. The idea behind this series is rooted in a core part of our work at the center, which is to pr promote the serious study of the past, not only in and of itself, but because it enables us to understand the present better. We began the History Matters series last month with Professor Deborah Lipstadt, who spoke about anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, past and present. When we first imagined this series, we wanted to demonstrate the relevance of history to the present. But we really could not have imagined how relevant it would be for tonight's event, featuring Professor Jan Gross. What I'm referring to is, and Yoni, we can move the slide, What I'm referring to is this bill passed by the Polish parliament and signed into law by Polish President Duda on February 6, 2018. The law holds criminally liable anyone who maintains that, quote, the Polish nation or the Republic of Poland is responsible or co-responsible for Nazi crimes committed by the Third Reich, unquote. This formulation, which has generated a good deal of controversy to be sure, takes rise against the backdrop of a number of key and seemingly countervailing factors. First, the revival of an open Jewish life in Poland after more than four decades, four and a half decades of communist suppression, which followed, of course, the Holocaust. Second, the warming of relations between the Republic of Poland and the State of Israel after the fall of communism. Third, the reemergence of the right-wing Law and Justice Party as the leading political force in Poland, part of a wider global trend towards ethno-nationalist regimes. Fourth, the passing of the generation of Holocaust survivors from the world. To many, myself included, the new Polish law reads, on the face of it, as a form of denial of the complicity of some Poles in the murder of Jews. And that is why tonight's event could not come at a more timely moment. Jan Gross, whom I'll introduce shortly, is one of the world's leading authorities on Poland, Polish Jews, and the Second World War. He'll be in conversation tonight with our own Dr. Jonathan Brent, of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. Before introducing them, I want to pause briefly to note that the Center for Jewish History, home to perhaps the world's greatest collection of ar archival documents held by our partner organizations, exists and thrives only due to the generosity of friends who appreciate how much Jewish history matters. We are honored that our History Matters series has been underwritten by Jonathan and Dina Leader, to whom my distinguished predecessor, Joel Levy, uh, introduced me. We're delighted that the leaders have come up from Florida for tonight's event, and I'd like to ask John to come up and offer some brief words of welcome. Jonathan Leader. Well, I never thought I'd see so many people at a history lecture. <laughs> I looked on StubHub at six o'clock and I saw seats were going for over $1,000, so <laughs> looks like uh, you're gonna make a lot of money. Um, Dean and I are very uh, honored and proud to sponsor this series of uh, lectures. Uh, one of my weaknesses when I'm not reading history books is watching NBA basketball. Uh, the All-Star game was the other night. I see some of you nodding. And to me, this series of lectures is, is, is even better. It's just an all-star uh, lineup of wonderful professors uh, who spend their lives studying and writing about Jewish topics. And of course, as we just heard, uh, for those of you who speak a tiny bit of Yiddish, it's really beshert that we have Professor Gross tonight. It couldn't be more timely. 
I want to say one other thing, and that is Dina and I are very proud to be a member of the New York Jewish community. Florida is just for a few months a year. I was born in Mount Sinai Hospital and spent my whole life here. We're very proud to be a member of, members of the New York Jewish community where we feel there are more intellectual and cultural activities than presented by any other religious or cultural group in New York. It's something you may think of from time to time, but the outpouring of events and activities is, is really staggering. And the cultural life for Jewish people in New York, to me, is really like a, a crown of jewels. We have museums, we have synagogues, we have JCCs, we have universities, we have Jewish cultural centers, all of which are striving to put on wonderful exhibits, wonderful performances, and wonderful events. And it's something that we should all be very, very proud of. I really feel that it's unique to the Jewish population of New York City. The Center for Jewish History is a wonderful jewel in this crown. Now headed by Professor David Myers, a world-renowned expert on Jewish history, the center offers lectures, classes, trips. A few years ago, Dean and I, in a room upstairs, took a wonderful series of very small classes with Professor Samuel Cassow of Trinity College where he compared the various ghettos. I remember the Vilna ghetto, the Lodz ghetto. It was thrilling. It was just absolutely thrilling to hear him give these talks. And of course, in addition to all that, the center has hundreds and thousands, maybe millions of books and documents about Jewish history. So we're asking you all to take advantage of these riches, especially at the Center for Jewish History. And if the stock market's been good to you, if you feel like you can put your name on something, it's very rewarding. It's very rewarding to have your name on a series of lectures like these, to be able to look out at all of you and to know that we're gonna have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, John. I think we have found ourselves a new director of development. I'm <laughs> delighted to. Um, just two more brief um, uh, uh, words before we commence. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce Councilman and Judge Lansman, uh, with whom we are working on a very exciting new project that we hope will reach fruition and be available to the widest possible public on a very exciting chapter in the history of the Jews. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the indefatigable Center for Jewish History staff, which every day comes to work with passion and commitment, devotion to the cause of promoting the study of Jewish history, and does so with extraordinary competence uh, and verve, and they really have gone above and beyond the call of duty tonight, so thank you to the CJH staff. <laughs> and now to tonight's program featuring Jan Gross in conversation with Jonathan Brent. Jan Gross is the Norman B. Tomlinson Professor Emeritus of War and Society at Princeton University. He was born in Warsaw to a Jewish father and Catholic mother, who helped save his father during the Second World War. As a high schooler, Jan Gross joined together with his friend, the former dissident and eminent intellectual Adam Micknick, to form a society of contradiction seekers, which we might well see as a telling indication of his future intellectual disposition. After high school, Gross was involved in the student protest movement against the communist system in 1968, which earned him expulsion from the University of Warsaw and imprisonment. A year later, he and his parents emigrated to the United States, where he undertook studies at Yale, uh, completing a PhD in sociology in 1975. At Yale, he worked under the renowned Juan Linz, who is often invoked today for formulating a litmus test to measure the strength, strength of democracy in times of crisis. After receiving the PhD, Professor Gross taught at Yale Emory, and NYU before joining the history department at Princeton in 2003. His first books dealt with, in succession, Poland under the Nazi regime and then under Soviet occupation. On the basis of these books, Jan Gross was awarded the Order of Merit of the Republic of Poland in 1996. And here's where the story gets complicated. 
in 2001, Jan Gross turned his attention to a new topic, the nature of relations between Jewish and non-Jewish Poles in the small Polish town of Yedwabne. In this book, Neighbors, he describes how on one day in July 1941, the Catholic residents of the town turned on and brutally murdered some of the Jews, most of the Jews of the town. On the basis of this book's findings, then Polish president Alexander Kwasniewski traveled to Yedwabne and declared, we cannot have any doubts. Here in Yedwabne, citizens of the Republic of Poland died from the hands of other citizens of the Republic of Poland. Professor Gross's unsettling accounts in Neighbors, as well as in two subsequent books dealing with Polish behavior towards Jews during and after the Second World War, Fear and Golden Harvest, have raised the ire, suffice it to say, of hardline nationalists in Poland. They are intent on presenting a sanitized narrative of the past, of unvarnished ethical virtue on the part of Poles during the Second World War, which most serious scholars of the subject have found difficult, if not impossible, to sustain. As political winds have changed, these revisionist perspectives have gained favor in the eyes of nationalist leaders, excuse me, government leaders. Conversely, Jan Gross's works have come under attack, including a threat of prosecution for libel in Poland in 2015. A year later, the Polish president, current President Duda, ordered an inquiry into Professor Gross's Order of Merit from 1996. In reviewing the case of Professor Jan Gross, we gain a clear sense that history matters, that the past is both alive and compelling in the present. This is especially so today. As the generation of eyewitnesses is soon to pass, the risk increases of distortions to or even erasure of the historical record. It is at this tenuous point that Jan Gross's work makes a bold intervention, seeking to peel away long-standing myths and lay down a foundation of truth for future generations. We owe him a debt of gratitude for his work, for his courage, his persistence, and his commitment in the face of challenge. Today, Professor Gross will be in conversation with Dr. Jonathan Brent, Executive Director and CEO of the EVO Institute for Jewish Research. Jonathan is not only an exceptional leader of EVO, which has flourished under his tenure, and as I hear the dulcet tones of a cell phone, might I encourage you to power down at this point. He is himself an important scholar of Eastern European history, author of two volumes drawn from the Soviet archives on Joseph Stalin. His 2003 book, co-written with Vladimir Naumov, exhaustively chronicled the infamous plot against Jewish doctors in the Soviet Union in 1952-53. I'm delighted that Jonathan is with us to draw out the links between past and present, and I'm delighted that Evo has joined with the center in sponsoring tonight's event. And without further ado, I'd like to call to the stage Jan Gross and Jonathan Brent. Thank you. Um, the, Evo, the Evo Institute is very sensitive to the problem of the erasure of Jewish history, the erasure of Jewish memory. We have an exhibit now that I would invite all of you to go and see uh, in the Smart Gallery on the extraordinary heroism of those in the Evo community in 1941 in their effort to save the remnant of Jewish culture of Eastern Europe. And so it was with great alarm that we received the news of this law 
which appears to be yet another attempt at erasing Jewish memory, erasing Jewish experience. But now, the truth of the Holocaust and the truth of Poland's uh, uh, activity or the truth of certain Poles in Poland uh, in, in that. And so my first question really, there, there are so many questions to ask, but my first question, Jan, is to ask what you think the real long-term damage of this law is going to be, both in terms of Polish society, which as David noted, had to many eyes made tremendous progress over the last 27 years since, since the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, where uh, not just Jewish scholars, but Polish scholars were encouraged to, to do genuine research, authentic research, to come to the West. Uh, we've had at Evo many interns, uh, Polish uh, students, Polish faculty who have come here and studied with us. So what, what do you think the long-term damage to Polish culture will be, and, and of course, the long-term damage to Jewish-Polish relations as a consequence of this? Mm, thank you very much. Thank you much, uh, Jonathan. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and I, I wanted to um, express my great uh, sense of uh, pride and honor at being invited here to participate in uh, <clears throat> Uh, this uh, series of uh, meetings and lectures. Uh, this is such a fantastic institution and I've been uh, working here and, and speaking on various occasions since uh, many, many uh, decades and it's, uh, um, I'm truly very moved. Uh, your, your question is very, I mean, it's, it's difficult, it's very, very hard really to, uh, to make uh, sense of it uh, uh, long term it seems to me uh, this was this was a, 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 a this came as a surprise frankly uh, <clears throat> in uh, in a way there is a history to this law of course uh, in itself uh, which which is worth uh, mentioning it's uh, it's not uh, just uh, an idea that uh, came up out of the blue in, uh, in 2005. Um, already there was a period of, of uh, um, two years where the same party, Law and Justice, uh, uh, controlled the, the, held the government in Poland and, and also the, the presidency, uh, where two siblings were both prime minister and, and, uh, and, and president, the Kaczynski brothers. And uh, uh, during this period already, um, again in amending the, the law that governs the way in which this institution, Institute of National Memory works, uh, they have uh, tried to put more or less the same idea on the books. Um, and uh, uh, this was an effort that was quashed by the Constitutional Tribunal at the time. Um, the law was challenged and found to be unconstitutional um, and uh, therefore it wasn't there on, on the books. Now, as far as this episode of introduction of the law is concerned, uh, they, they have drafted it quite a long time ago, about a year and a half ago, the Minister of Justice very proudly announced. Um, literally, it hasn't been changed, I think. They may have added a, a, a clause, which is also scandalous in its own right, about uh, some aspects of regulating by law uh, Ukrainian-Polish history uh, during that time, at a, at a later uh, period. But about a year and a half ago, more or less, this wording was put on. And uh, um, for during during the time that lapsed um, between the announcement that the law had already been approved by the government that it's tabled and and the, the parliament will vote on it at a certain point it wasn't clear when and the enactment of it on, on January 26th uh, they received a lot of feedback 
really, and, and kind of a critical feedback from various directions, uh, from some Israeli institutions, Yad Vashem, I know, spoke uh, to them about it, um, but also from Polish uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for example, which, uh, uh, which expressed uh, uh, considerable worries that this, is, this sort of phrasing would, would not really uh, do the job, which allegedly was to uh, take care of what uh, Polish governments have found uh, to be scandalous for a good period of time, about 10 or 15 years already. Polish diplomacy was really very busy uh, dealing with it. Namely, the use of the phrase Polish extermination camps. Uh, in, uh, mm, uh, in, in, in in journalistic accounts, uh, usually abroad in, in some kinds of narratives uh, uh, that dealt with uh, the Holocaust matters. Uh, but, uh, uh, of course, what's, what's so conspicuous, you had the law put on here, we could all read it, is uh, that the phrase, uh, uh, Polish extermination camps, uh, does not even figure in this uh, in in the formulation that they have used, and I mention this as a, as a very important element here, uh, because if you think about sort of stirring up a certain uh, degree of hysteria in Poland over the passing of this law, it has to do uh, uh, very directly with uh, government propaganda, which presents the law as a law which uh, sort of defends the truth and Polish dignity by uh, stating clearly that Poles, which is of course uh, a, a fact not contested by anyone, have not set up extermination camps during the Second World War, and suddenly there is, a, there is an outburst of public opinion in Israel and in the States which prevents this from being carried out. So uh, to a Polish audience, of course, it plays uh, like a uh, uh, truly uh, quite uh, dramatic uh, um, and unfair interference with uh, Poland's uh, sovereign right to legislate and to presumably defend its good name through this mm -hmm. legislation. In a, in a way, the, what, you, what you're saying about the phrase Polish extermination camps, though, is, is something of a uh, Trojan horse, it seems to me, because in effect, the, the law is also going to shut down other kinds of research. In, a, in an article not long ago, you stirred up a lot of trouble by mentioning that more uh, Jews were killed by Poles than Germans were killed by Poles. And it created uh, yet another wave of, of uh, sort of some hysteria in the, in, in the Polish press and so forth. And I wonder if you could speak about that and why that is a significant finding and why Polish society is so resistant. Uh, you know, what has happened in Poland over the last 15 years or so was uh, the emergence of an extraordinarily profound and uh, uh, thorough uh, historiography of the Holocaust, carried out by uh, um, um, uh, a large number, in fact, of, of Polish scholars. Uh, uh, half a dozen historians, uh, several ethnographers, literary scholars, uh, dealing with uh, um, uh, precisely these various aspects of complicity uh, during the Second World War with uh, persecution of Jews uh, um, under the German occupation. And uh, uh, this historiography that came up and this uh, uh, works, works of art also that have been produced uh, uh, that, that were referencing this phenomenon, whether theater pieces, films, all of it became a, an extraordinary difficult thing to accept for uh, this sort of right-wing nationalist xenophobic um, political uh, style that was introduced by this law and justice party. 
And uh, uh, this law is, is very uh, directly, in, in my judgment, uh, addressed to uh, uh, and, and, and kind of framed in such a way as to stifle, uh, of course, uh, research and work on this subject. But even more than that, its, uh, uh, its impact, it seems to me, will be felt uh, uh, most dramatically in uh, uh, general education on, on Polish history, on the history of the Second World War, and uh, on, the, on the Holocaust itself. I, I can hardly see uh, now uh, uh, high school teachers who, um, who will dare to speak about such phenomena as Jedwabne, uh, to use a code word here, this is not just an episode of what happened in Jedwabne, this uh, uh, kind of uh, involvement of various segments of the Polish population in, in direct uh, persecution mm -hmm. of, of Jews was, uh, was something that took place in a variety of contexts, in a variety of places. And, and, and there was a stirring over the last 15 years. You, you mentioned that this was a very interesting period where a lot of good work had been done and a kind of an opening. The Museum Pauline was established on, on a very broad front. It was not just a matter of Holocaust-related research. And a great interest also among, still these were kind of uh, selected milieus, but uh, high school teachers to introduce these subjects into schools I participated in several summer programs carried out uh, in, in Krakow uh, where uh, teachers from all over Poland would sign up and, uh, and come for a week or so of very intense education on the Holocaust uh, so that they could then carry on and, and, and teach in their schools. Uh, I think that all of this, I mean, this is the main addressee in some way, as far as the concrete consequences are concerned. You know? Well, do you, think, do you think that this is going to simply chill research, or is it going to lead to the harassment and overt uh, anti-Semitic acts against those people doing the research? Is, is this a, how would you assess it? I, I know it's difficult. Yeah. No. <laughs> You know, it, it, it will have a chilling effect, uh, undoubtedly. Not so much with people who have been involved in that research for a very long time. I mean, there was a provision here, as you can, as you can tell, that uh, essentially no offense is committed if the criminal act is uh, uh, committed in the art of one's artistic or academic activity, presumably. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a certain exemption on, uh, for, uh, for for scholars, but of course, uh, it's up to them to decide uh, at, at various times who is a scholar. When, uh, when commentaries are made about my work, for example, uh, it's, it's very frequent that people will say, well, first of all, this guy is not a historian, he's a sociologist. But then they will say, he's not, this is not scientific what he does, this is sort of journalistic. Uh, so one, the, 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 these definitions are fluid, and uh, um, the, the paragraph I wouldn't take much heart in, in it as a, as a kind of a protection. So chilling effect, uh, the, the, for sure. But in, for instance, I, I, I can hardly see young people who would want, who would be passionate about the subject matter, joining in now and going uh, to get education yeah. on this yeah. subject. Um. Um, this is the $64,000 question, I think. Is, is this law fueled by Polish anti-Semitism or is this law fueled by considerations of simply maintaining Polish honor, the honor of the Polish nation? Or is the honor of the Polish nation somehow dependent upon the erasure of this history. Uh, there are several aspects to, uh, to, to, to what's happening now in Poland. One question and one issue is just the framing and the formulation of this law and the passing of it. 
The other issue is what followed afterwards uh, and uh, the sort of governmental response to it and also a, a sort of a societal reaction to within the last month or so to um, government propaganda and the way in which government propaganda framed responses abroad to this, to, to this law and presented it uh, to, to the audience. So uh, I would say that the passing of the law it, it itself is just sits within uh, the, uh, the kind of a very more general concern that this law and justice party had with, uh, if you will, a sort of reformulation of the past. Uh, their, their legitimacy, in some sense, does not reside in some sort of a vision of the future. They don't have a program beyond the, uh, beyond the wish to transform and change institution in such a way uh, that they would be able to keep, uh, to stay in power uh, for a very long time. And this is what they do, very step by step. This is why they got in trouble with the European community, for example, by uh, sort of destroying the rudiments of rule of law and independence of the judiciary system, for example, which, uh, which was uh, a considerable impediment to, to their ability to pass any law they wished. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the original intent, it seems to me, is, uh, sits in that project of rewriting history. Rewriting history, uh, first of all, the history of solidarity, if you will, from which Wałęsa will be wiped out and the, the Kaczyński brothers will be put in, especially the late Kaczyński brother, the, the, the Lech Kaczyński who, who died in a plane accident as president of Poland, the rewriting of history uh, of this uh, plane accident, uh, which, uh, which, uh, um, which is portrayed as a, a coup that has been engineered between some nefarious forces within Poland itself and abroad. So, the, in other words, the molding of Poland uh, first of all, as a country uh, that had always been victimized, and secondly, as a, as a society and country that had uh, uh, displayed only exemplary and heroic behavior. So in that sense, it, it's very important to, uh, uh, to address this issue that suddenly became such, a, such an important element of public discourse of the last 20 years. And, uh, and so successfully, in fact, uh, has been uh, investigated um, in, in Poland itself. Uh, in that sense, it's, this is part of, of sort of drawing the picture uh, of these, uh, as I said, victimized and very, very noble and honorable uh, society. But the moment it happened, the law was passed, uh, the, the response of the regime uh, was uh, to really harden its stance and to explore this issue of uh, where anti-Semitic sentiments were, uh, were uh, brought up to the surface uh, uh, with uh, just uh, very cynically, it seems to me, and, and by, um, by the government. And, uh, uh, their constituency, unfortunately, is a constituency uh, on, on the, this is a right-wing party. And the, the, the great uh, mm, political skill and success that the leader of that party claims for himself is that he prevented the emergence of even more radical opposition on the right. Uh, this, is, this is no small matter for him because he looks as a, as a model of successful right-wing shift towards authoritarianism uh, on the, uh, the, the example of what's happening in Germany. And um, in Germany, the leader of Germany, uh, who has very similar ambitions as, as uh, Kaczynski and, and carries them uh, with greater skill for a longer time already. However, there is an opposition on his right an openly anti-Semitic party, Jobbik, which, uh, uh, which gives him trouble, so to speak. And Kaczynski always 
sort of viewed himself as this incredibly skillful manipulator who, who could preempt the emergence of the opposition on the right. Uh, well, the consequence of it was that he, in fact, became um, um, very much uh, mm -hmm. uh, beholden, if you will, to this uh, very radical uh, right-wing sentiments, including anti-Semitism. Has there been any public repudiation of this law in Poland? Oh, yes. There, there, is, a, there is a big um, wave of uh, a reaction and response to it uh, by opposition politicians. So, uh, opposition politicians and uh, journalists, the main, main weeklies in Poland, uh, Polityka uh, or Newsweek or Tygodnik Powszechny, this is a Catholic weekly with a long, wonderful tradition. Uh, the, the, the main newspaper, uh, the daily newspaper, Gazeta Wyborcza, I don't know whether it's a main newspaper, any longer uh, also. Uh, there is a very powerful television channel w which is private on, I think, by, in the end, by American um, uh, sponsors, uh, TVN24, uh, whose uh, journalists are also uh, dealing with the subject, all of it. So you see a lot of opposition and criticism uh, um, in no uncertain terms, as it were. Well, a few years ago, there was a survey which I believe sh uh, had the, the conclusion that something like 48% of the Polish nation had uh, significant anti-Semitic feelings in it. Do you think that the, the, the size of, of that... Uh, anti-Semitic right-wing base is growing. That's what the politicians are playing into. Is it is it stable? And and I guess this leads to the larger question of the the growth of nationalism throughout Euro Europe and Eastern Europe and Russia is very visible to everybody today. Twenty-five years ago, it was not so visible. Twenty years ago, but it was there. Can it be stopped in Poland? Do you see this as kind of an inevitable process that has been unleashed uh, by democratization? Well, the, the sort of xenophobic populism which is grounded in, uh, 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 in the pool of uh, um, nationalist uh, uh, imaginarium, if you will, and, and uh, symbols and uh, references uh, is very strong uh, in Poland and in, in various parts of, of Eastern Europe in particular. Uh, and uh, um, I think that the, the, the confrontation with it um, that will have to be uh, uh, taking place within these societies will is, uh, is going to be a very difficult struggle. Um, the, the people locally are very much aware of, of, the, of the threat and the danger. Uh, this is, this is uh, a minority. They are in opposition, therefore, and not, not, not in, in government, if you will, uh, but uh, uh, very clear-minded about it, uh, it seems to me. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, it's uh, the w one thing which is also characteristic of this regime, and I think that may um, eventually sort of lead to some kind of a critical reevaluation by the electorate, is that, that this is a, 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 a group of people who uh, prove to be extraordinarily incompetent in in, a, in various things that they do. You know, it's just. Uh, uh, they, they have, within, within two years, uh, they have ruined uh, uh, Poland's standing in international arena. That's not very difficult to perceive this. So foreign policy in shambles. Uh, they, have, uh, they have destroyed, really, uh, Poland's uh, um, uh, military. The, 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 there was a particularly obnoxious politician who was in charge as a, as a defense minister and uh, his uh, reign uh, was just uh, uh, created total mayhem. You know, it was just a lot of general officers to have him dismissed. And, um, 
the uh, public media have been turned from uh, uh, from media into, uh, if you will, propaganda tube for uh, for the government. And and again, I mean, there is an audience which appreciates it, but but everybody can uh, also observe it and and and, and tell. Uh, what the consequences of it are. So, uh, how it will play out? Um, well, it's it, it's very hard to predict. But but the the restructuring of the judiciary is a very big issue, it seems to me, and the dismantling of the Polish judiciary and the 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 uh, implanting of their own justices. So they're the, they've taken control of the judiciary, um, and so this nationalist right-wing government really controls all of the levers of power, yes? Uh, you used the word totalitarian earlier. Uh, to, to, to what extent uh, do you think this is becoming totalitarian or is? Uh, in in in, in Russia, it is very clearly a top-down authoritarian state. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. Yeah. Yeah, totalitarian is a term that I would use in this occasion, but it's, uh, the turn towards authoritarianism is very uh, evident. This is uh, what, what they want to do is uh, undermine uh, democratic institutions. And it's, uh, so the, the, the first thing mm, um, was the dismantling of the legal system and, and uh, destroying the constitutional tribunal uh, first of all, because this this was a kind of a um, um, the, the, the way in which uh, the legislation that was being passed by them could be uh, evaluated and uh, and um, sort of turned down, if you will. So that was that that was the first step. And so the, the, they have now amended uh, electoral law. We'll see. The, the big test will come in a, in a sequence of elections that will take place. Uh, and not only in the sense of uh, the, where we'll be able to see uh, how, how the preferences in, in, in Polish society line up and, and whether people still want to vote for them. Unfortunately, public opinion polls seem to signify that they, uh, that, that, that they have a very strong support. Uh, but uh, whether the electoral system works, you know, they've, they've introduced new uh, many uh, quite shocking uh, innovations. For example, on a on a ballot uh, now, if you uh, if you change your mind, you can cross uh, your your the, your first choice that you made, and then put in your a new choice uh, uh, with with a little cross. So, as you can imagine, whoever counts these ballots uh, will be able to. Uh, uh, to be very creative about it. So, uh, it's, uh, and the, 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 in the process of, of, of introducing this, this whole slide towards authoritarianism, uh, this, is, uh, this, uh, this is a political elite that had committed a lot of uh, um, transgressions. Legal. In, in, they, they have violated the constitution repeatedly. That's why they are in trouble with the European Community, for example. So, for them now, uh, losing elections is a very costly affair because many of the top, the president and several legislators and people who are very visible in this process of reframing institutions uh, would be liable to be put uh, in front of. Uh, uh, state tribunal. So, the pressure of the government exerts is exerted in different ways. Uh, in in your case, uh, you were you came under severe uh, public criticism, rebuke from many different sides. But it was very strange for me going into the museum dedicated to Oskar Schindler uh, this past year, which is a museum dedicated to the story of Schindler's saving of the Jews. And to find in the middle of the exhibit a segment on the Katyn massacre. 
And I marveled to myself, what does Katyn have to do with Oskar Schindler? And in front of the Katyn massacre uh, module, uh, there were a group of Poles discussing it. And when I asked a Polish friend of mine what the meaning of this might be, she said, well, it's very obvious. Uh, Judeo-Bolsheviks murdered the Poles in Katyn, and therefore it's kind of balanced history now. And I wonder what your thoughts uh, are on, on this double genocide idea and the, the uh, measures that seem to be taken almost invisibly by the Polish government in manipulating Polish institutions to acknowledge it. Yes, I, I, I just heard that a new term has been introduced uh, into public speech, namely Holocaust. Uh, I, I, I can't um, say more about it because I think it's a, it's a very recent innovation, but, but somebody has uh, come up with a suggestion that maybe this should be introduced to the world and uh, so that the sufferings of non-Jews in Poland during the Second World War are recognized as well. This is, this is a very uh, uh, important theme, if you will, in, uh, uh, in the um, kind of construction and appraisal of the experience of the Second World War. Uh, the, uh, the bringing about and referencing uh, the um, martyrology of, uh, of non-Jewish Poles. I, I mean, in, a, in, in the parlance that one uses uh, 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 would be uh, Poles as opposed to Jews. It's a very strange, it's a very strange phenomenon as I think about it to me, to realize that the death of three million Polish citizens in the most horrifying circumstances is not incorporated in, in the way people think about this period into Polish history. This is not ours. This is not us. This is them. And uh, one of the consequences of it, uh, of course, is uh, uh, the sense that uh, uh, we must, we the Poles, we must uh, propose a sort of a competing uh, record of suffering uh, to, uh, to match or in any case to, uh, to counterbalance uh, the record of suffering uh, of those of Jews. And, uh, and I think what, what, what what I what I hoped uh, w would uh, uh, would begin with the opening of historiography and and the review of what uh, uh, what happened during the Second World War uh, that it will open the process of recognizing that this is part of Polish history and that uh, that one uh, and, and one must teach about it. And uh, without sort of mourning the loss, in a way, uh, the society could not heal and recover in a, in a, in a sensible way. And uh, uh, some steps were made in that direction, but, but they were cut short by, by these radical nationalists that came to power now. Uh, I wonder whether we should not um, open this to questions. In fact, uh, I had originally proposed that the audience should sit on the stage and Professor, uh, Professor Gross uh, should sit in the audience because I'm sure everyone here has uh, a question or two uh, to, to ask. We ask only that it not be a declamation, <laughs> a critique of world history, um, and that it indeed be a question pointed uh, that has an answer, a possible answer. Okay. So we will now open the floor to questions. Uh, Judah will bring the microphone. Yes, um, I see. Uh, the microphone will come your way. 
Yes. Judah, right there. Thank you. Could, could you talk about your understanding about the relationship between this growing nationalism and anti-Semitism? Not only, I mean, we see there may be parallels in other countries, which are especially disturbing, but for the moment we're talking about Poland. Uh, you know, there is, there is a very um, deep uh, linkage in, in, in Polish tradition be between the two. The most recent political tradition, if you will, if you look back into uh, the 20th century, into the interwar period in particular, when uh, still there were uh, three point three three million three hundred thousand Jews living in Poland, uh, and uh, in the the country has been re uh, resurrected after a long lapse uh, when uh, it, it, it was under uh, was partitioned by by neighboring uh, neighboring powers. Now the process of um, forging a new um, state politics, if you will, uh, very much uh, also involved uh, the uh, dealing with with uh, in in political rhetoric with national minorities there. And for, uh, for the right-wing National Democratic Party and even more uh, radical uh, elements of nationalism, the camp of uh, um, the National Radical Camp, uh, an organization which is still doing very well in Poland uh, today, that aspect of uh, um, unwanted Jewish presence in Poland uh, that should uh, that should be uh, somehow dealt with uh, was very much a central element of of nationalist ideology. So, uh, within Polish nationalism, uh, a modern form of it, that element of anti-Semitism is a is a uh, one of the constitutive elements, uh, and uh, mm, and in that sense, uh, this is. Uh, you, you can see how how that sentiment uh, um, is is very much alive. You know, the, Jonathan mentioned this. Uh, there are um, public opinion. There is public opinion research on uh, anti-Semitic sentiments in Polish society, and, and they they remain strong. Recently, they grew in intensity, um, even though there are no Jews in Poland. Of course, I know there are very few. Uh, 10, maybe 20,000 in a country of 35 million, I think, or almost, to be, um, it's more now, it's 30, 38, so it's totally insignificant. Uh, yes, behind Joy, behind. Yeah, um, I wonder if you could compare the Polish law to uh, comparable legislation or policies in Lithuania and Ukraine with um, the double genocide and also um, you mentioned the uh, in the law uh, relations be uh, aspect of the connection between Poland and Ukraine that is addressed and how that plays out. Uh, there is no Poland is a slightly different uh, uh, case, if you will, than than, than Lithuania uh, and Ukraine in, in, in fundamentally because it was not part of the Soviet Union throughout uh, a, a large stretch of the 20th century. It's different for Lithuania than for Ukraine, but nevertheless, uh, Lithuania also until 1989. So the, 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 the story, uh, if you will, of uh, first of all forging national consciousness uh, is, uh, mm, is different because of a certain decalage uh, in, uh, in the case of those lands that were uh, the Soviet republics, and also the degree and the severity of uh, uh, Stalinist and Soviet repression in these areas uh, is incomparable to what uh, has happened uh, in Poland. So uh, there is no, 
in Poland, it never came up as an issue, this, uh, uh, the, um, the question of uh, a sort of two genocides, as it were, uh, that have to be laid uh, side by side, and that uh, on, the, on, on one hand, uh, one speaks uh, of, uh, about the Holocaust, but then uh, the local societies have experienced uh, a, a genocide at, at the hands of, of Soviet authorities. Uh, in, in the case of Ukraine, it's, uh, I mean, literally this, uh, this induced hunger uh, that has taken place there in, um, in, in, in the middle 1930s uh, is, is brought in as a, as a narrative of, uh, of, of martyrology that, that, that is paired with, uh, if you will, the, uh, the Holocaust. Such a, this is, this is not the case in Poland at all. Uh, in, in Poland, um, uh, uh, what you will find is uh, um, um, much more the kind of a competitiveness in, in victimhood, if you will, with respect to what happened during the Second World War, exclusively. Yes, um, further up the road, um, on the... This current, is this working? This current Polish government uh, seems to be uh, mimicking, in a way, the current Hungarian government. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if its position in an international context is weaker, because Orban can more easily flirt with Russia and try to fend off pressure from the European Union but how can Poland flirt with Russia? I mean, Russia is one of uh, Poland's both historic and more recent uh, enemies, so that Poland has no other uh, hand to play against, the Europe, against European Union pressure if that pressure begins to mount. Uh, you're right. I mean, many, many people in Poland have point this out to, uh, as one of the incomprehensible elements of uh, the current regime's uh, uh, behavior, that it, uh, that it really um, uh, kind of sets uh, at work a dynamics which uh, uh, puts Poland at, at cross purposes with uh, uh, with the European Union, with uh, the, currently the United States, uh, uh, or Israel, which uh, f f was uh, at least rhetorically viewed as a very important ally of Poland. Uh, there were um, very intense uh, uh, economic relationships that have developed over the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, and, and, leaves, uh, and leaves this uh, uh, regime of law and justice party uh, with, uh, in fact, only one uh, uh, direction to look at for allies, uh, namely East. And this is, this is a very constant theme in, uh, in the challenge to what's going on currently in Poland, uh, raised by political opposition. Uh, so, uh, the, the main difference in, in kind of reorganizing internal politics between, between Hungary and Poland uh, that one may note is that Orban had a constitutional majority so that he could put through uh, these, uh, the reframing of uh, the laws uh, that will guarantee him a, a very powerful uh, prime ministership uh, and, and to his party a very strong position uh, without, if you will, violating the Constitution. This was not the case in Poland. Uh, the uh, Law and Justice Party did not have a constitutional majority, and uh, one of the speculations, for example, that has been raised by uh, various observers over the last, over the crisis that had uh, taken place uh, after the introduction of this law, <coughs> was that Kaczynski and the Law and Justice Party wanted to, once they once it was noted that there is such a stark response internationally to the passage of this law, they, instead of backing off, uh, they went further and uh, mm, actually got it passed finally, 
the, 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 in, the very adverse international response occurred after the first chamber of parliament, the lower chamber of parliament passed it. The law could have been amended or quashed uh, in the Senate, uh, but quite the opposite happened. After the first moment of hesitation, then uh, Kaczynski obviously ordered that the Senate will just very quickly vote the law without any amendments, any changes. And then the president was in fact ordered to sign it, and he did it. Uh, so the, the speculation was of commentators that this was for Kaczynski a, a, a move to shore up uh, support on the uh, extreme right in order to get public opinion polls that might uh, mm, uh, justify calling for earlier elections uh, that would give him a constitutional majority. Um, it doesn't seem that this has happened, that, that they got such a jump in, in, in public opinion polls in, in terms of support as a result of this confrontation. Essentially playing on the, on the note that uh, you know, no foreigners will dictate to us how to legislate, first of all, and nobody will, uh, has the right to uh, prevent us from uh, defending our good name and historical truth, namely that there were no uh, Polish extermination camps. This is the internal phrase that's being played there as a um, full sense uh, of, of this law. Nothing else mat matters, presumably. So uh, um, I don't think they got what they wanted if this was the strategy. Uh, and, uh, and now it's just a huge mess uh, that, uh, that has uh, resulted from it and, and they are trying to deal with it. You know, Professor Gross, a, a number of questioners have pointed to other nodal points in Europe uh, that seem to be undergoing a similar process. It, it calls to mind um, the seeming rapidity or speed with which the institutions of a democratic order, certainly that followed the Second World War and the collapse of communism in the case of Eastern Europe, um, the foundations of that democratic order have been shattered, seeming, it's seemingly with, with great rapidity. And my, I, I wonder if you think that what we're seeing now uh, is the norm and what we saw in an earlier generation, which was a certain inhibition on expressing uh, such views as we see today, a certain inhibition against distortion or, uh, or erasure, a certain commitment to liberal democratic values, was that earlier period of the exception, and what we're seeing now is the unleashing of the natural instincts uh, of a political order in Europe continent-wide? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, um, I don't really know what are the na natural instincts, so I, I, I'm hesitant to, to deal with it uh, and, and, uh, and somehow comment on it, but, but, but something, something very bizarre is happening in politics. And it's, it doesn't only affect Europe. I think no. uh, we are experiencing <laughs> it. We are experiencing it on, on, on our own uh, lives in a very dramatic fashion. I mean, how could a the, the very old democracy, if you will, um, and with with uh, these wonderfully uh, deeply institutionalized uh, um, uh, procedures and uh, uh, framework of democratic uh, politics elect uh, uh, this bizarre uh, fellow. <laughs> so uh, in that sense, I, I, it, it seems to me, I, I think it's a, very, it's a very difficult moment for democracy and it has to do with uh, a, a revolution that has taken place in, in, the, in the way in which information is processed. You have a situation now where anyone without the filter of newspapers, um, political parties, uh, uh, televisions, if you will, can reach millions of people instantaneously. And, uh, uh, um, and uh, I think that liberal democracy will, uh, will, have, will, will struggle for a while uh, with uh, a kind of a, 
adjusting institutionally to, to this new phenomenon. Uh, and uh, it's not just the ability to reach uh, uh, of a demagogue, but as we, as we know, I mean, I take the New York Times in hand today, there are these, th there is this phenomenon of massive injection of uh, uh, false information and uh, propaganda, if you will, in response to any crisis uh, that takes place. Uh, for example, the shootings in Florida. There is a big piece on the first page of the New York Times how these Russian uh, addresses, so to speak, uh, on, 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 on internet and various social media are just spewing all kinds of uh, um, uh, content that, that's, uh, um, that, that will confuse the minds of a lot of Americans uh, on, on, on this issue. So, uh, nationalism uh, came up as a threat, I think, to, to liberal order. In, in various parts uh, of Europe. Uh, it's uh, in, in response to the refugee crisis, for instance, that this was a very uh, clear uh, kind of a, a contextualization of it. Um, and uh, uh, you're right, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that, uh, that uh, threatens uh, liberal democracy in, in more places than just Poland. To, to, to what extent this is a nature uh, of, of a given uh, community coming uh, coming back to uh, to the surface, I'm uh, I, I would be hesitant to go that way. Okay. Yes, um, we'll come back down here. Councilman Lanzman. thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that you uh, made the, the the parallel. It was kind of the uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, we're not quite where Poland is, but we, as a country, were able to um, produce a Holocaust remembrance proclamation out of the White House that forgot to mention the, the Jews. <laughs> One has always had the sense that for all the, the craziness out in, in the world and, and the potential for this, the world order that emerged after the World War II and after the fall of communism, one constraint upon the world reverting to the, the dark places was the presence and the moral authority of the United States. To what extent do you see, having been a scholar of Poland and uh, that part of the world for, for, for decades, the erosion of the United States uh, moral authority or active engagement on these issues, the role of the, the United States being now part of one of many countries going through this nationalist fervor, um, the loss of that check, the loss of that restraint, what does that mean for what's going on in, in these countries and, and what does it mean for the Jews? I, mean, I think it's a disaster. It's, the, the, it, it's um, just, uh, f first of all, the figure of, uh, of this uh, ridiculous uh, uh, man who uh, uh, communicates with the rest of the world constantly. Uh, and it's uh, 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 unequivocally uh, bizarre always. And uh, uh, is uh, 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 given the position that he occupies, the President of the United States, in other words, the uh, traditional somehow foundation of Western Democracies. Uh, this is uh, this is a, mm, a process that uh, undermines the legitimacy of democratic order everywhere, and uh, and uh, um, not not to speak, of course, of, of very direct and present danger, which uh, uh, which uh, he represents as someone who can just make clear decisions that will involve us in all kinds of uh, warlike catastrophes. Uh, but but, the, but the, the draining of, uh, uh, you know, there is a certain decorum that goes. I mean, democracy is a very fragile uh, form of uh, interaction. People have to respect a lot of rules and uh, uh, have uh, consideration for those who have different opinions and 
Uh, and all of this is being uh, just uh, ridiculed uh, th throughout. So uh, I'm, I, I think he's much more dangerous than Kaczynski, Frank. Yes. Um, I was in Poland three or four years ago and there was a palpable sense of optimism in the Jewish community because many Poles were studying Yiddish, for example, in Krakow, and uh, 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 Gent Polish Gentiles were uh, uh, helping Jewish tourists understand the synagogues that, were, that, were, that they were touring. Um, and there was a growth in the Jewish community itself as more Poles discovered that they had Jewish roots. What has happened to that sense of optimism in the last few years as a result of the new government? And, 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 and where, is it, where is it going to go from here? You know, this is, uh, uh, what we are observing now is a very recent phenomenon. This is uh, a real crisis comes uh, um, as of January, really. Uh, that's with, with a very dramatic speed, we'll just falling down a big pit, so to speak. Uh, in general, what you just described, uh, it seems to me over the last 20 years, there was a, uh, there was a great process and, and, a, and a kind of a complex process that was going on, on in many uh, contexts. Uh, I mentioned several times this fantastic historiography and now there's a certain honesty with which um, the intellectual elite, or some part of it in Poland, was ready to confront the most difficult period uh, of, of the Second World War. But, but, but there was more, and there was a great curiosity, as you said, and very, very uh, broad interest in, in Judaica. Books on, on this subject would, were, uh, were read widely. They, they would be issued, and, and, and they had an audience. People were, there, there were cultural events that were taking place. There is, um, all, uh, one always makes reference to uh, this festival of Jewish culture in, in Krakow. I, I'm very fond of it uh, and uh, since uh, a long time ago. And it became a sort of a local, uh, um, very deeply ingrained local uh, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, treasure that, that uh, the society of Krakow and, and uh, uh, people living there and uh, coming from abroad and enjoy it very much and participate in it. But there were similar um, initiatives in a lot of smaller places, you know, curiosity about Jewish past of that place and some of occasions on which festivals would be organized and on a small scale, but nevertheless, they would indicate interest. Uh, the, the, of course, the construction of the, of the Museum of Polish Jews was a very important element there, uh, which it, it attracted a, a, a huge uh, a pool of visitors and uh, uh, I, I think was a very important step forward in, in recognition of uh, uh, the um, richness and existence and, and presence of uh, a Jewish presence in the history of Poland. Now, it's, it's, it's all in jeopardy now. I don't know how, how uh, dramatic that process of, uh, uh, of uh, mm, well, you know, the, the kind of a public space was invaded with anti-Semitic rhetoric. And this is, this is what, uh, uh, it, it, it no long, this is no longer a kind of a, uh, a phenomenon uh, that exists on the fringes. You find it now in public television. You find it uh, sub rosa in statements of uh, politicians. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in fact, if you think about it, this is the, the ruling regime has uh, instrumentally, uh, but openly drawn into the font of anti-Semitic uh, sentiment in order to build up its political appeal. No question about it, and this is novel. This is for the first time in 50 years. The last time this happened in, in Poland when a government would draw out and, and try to 
build uh, some legitimacy to its claims, drawing on anti-Semitism uh, that it assumed was dormant in the Polish population and was right about it, was in 1968. Uh, but this was a communist regime, and this was a part of a very complex struggle within the Communist Party itself. Uh, this is a party that had been elected in, in, in free elections. So, in a way, uh, the, the, the phenomenon is much more dangerous now than it was then. Uh, it's, uh, I see, however, also a kind of a... I, I, I wouldn't call pushback, but a kind of awakening of, uh, of the opposite sense if you will, in a significant segment of the Polish audience. I, in, in response to, to Johnson's question, I, I mentioned this already, but l let me rephrase it. Th there is a big spectrum of uh, public uh, fora, whether in print or in television or uh, in uh, mm, uh, social media, where people are openly outraged at uh, this uh, uh, instrumentalization of anti-Semitism by the regime and the emergence of anti-Semitic uh, um, um, acts, if you will, because it's not just uh, speech. You know, there are all kinds of things that are happening. Uh, you, you, many of you may have seen this, uh, uh, for example, the march uh, that has been carried out in Warsaw at the, six, at the 99th anniversary on, on, on 11th November, this is a, like the 4th of July of Poland, if you will, uh, which, uh, which, had the, which looked like a, a Nazi party rally which with uh, torches to carried and, and uh, all kinds of banners that were just horrible. They were drawing on um, uh, symbolism of, of political parties that were bitterly anti-Semitic before the war. And, uh, um, and there is a uh, there is a reaction of a, this significant segment of Polish society which is immune to these sentiments and which has been marginalized by this by this regime and which are which is speaking uh, I think in in uh, uh, forcefully so uh, somehow we'll see what emerges out of it but. Uh, since these are the guys who have who control education, who control public television, uh, who who have uh, access to uh, to funding through a, a government uh, budget, so to speak, you know, they can cut off fundings to uh, NGOs uh, that uh, that deal with, uh, with which have open society aspects and and. Uh, um, fund those who, who promote only very narrow-minded Catholic and nationalistic uh, uh, line. So, uh, and this will happen, of course. Uh, and I must add an, another element which is very important here too, and uh, very damaging, and, uh, and that's the attitude of the church. There is, there, is a, there, there is particularly a certain segment, a certain kind of Catholicism which is wedded with this regime. A Catholicism which is represented by this uh, priest uh, by the name of Ritzik, uh, who has a media empire himself, in, in, and who's been uh, uh, in, in 2008 uh, global anti-Semitism report, a report that was uh, prepared by the Department of State. I think they prepare it uh, occasionally. The, the outlet of, of this fellow uh, were the outlets, uh, the, his newspapers and, and radio, were considered to be most obnoxious and infectious, if you will, anti-Semitic media um, in Europe. He is the guru of the, current, uh, uh, of the current leaders. This is a person to whom they go, uh, where they go, the, the, these are the media where they, where they give their first interviews, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, this brand of Catholicism uh, is, is very powerful now and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and it has a, a very long tradition of uh, uh, instilling and uh, uh, proselytizing anti-Semitism very effectively 
in, okay. in Polish society. Okay, we have time for one more question. I'm going to ask you two to go all, up, all the way up to the back. Oops, woman on the aisle had her hand up for a long time, so please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gross and Dr. Brent. Professor, I read your book, Neighbors, and I had hoped to hear some comments about that. I'm veering off of the political spectrum. First, whatever happened with the libel lawsuit brought by the government? Second, how did you do that research and remain sane? <laughs> and third, what is the effect of that book on current Polish sentiment? Could there be another Jedwatny? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the end. Uh, no, I, I don't believe so, in part because uh, there are no more Jewish shtetls <laughs> in, in, in Poland, yeah. But uh, um, he, w w as far as a libel suit uh, is concerned, it, it, it's still brewing, so to speak. The, the, but, but, I mean, there are two episodes to it. Uh, uh, the first one had to do with a, a very um, good um, uh, finding by, by the prosecutor who quashed this investigation. Uh, he, he wrote a, a wonderful opinion on this, uh, showing uh, that um, it just uh, simply doesn't meet the provisions of the law. Uh, at all, and uh, and wanted to to just close the matter, but but his superiors, a, f a few days later, ordered him to continue. So this investigation continues. I haven't been, I, I haven't been accused of anything yet. What it's it's a very preliminary stage. The the prosecutor must decide whether to issue and formulate an accusation, and uh, and it's and it's still going on. And uh, uh, I've, my, my lawyer has been told that the prosecutor wants to, uh, to have another deposition from me. Uh, and, uh, and at some point, we'll decide on a, on a date, and I, will, and I will go and give a deposition. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, what, it had, what it has to do with. Presumably, I think he may have been um, told, we haven't seen the the files yet, and my lawyer will, will see it before I go. Uh, he, uh, he may have been told to find expert opinions and uh, got these expert opinions and now he will probably ask me about my response to expert opinions, whatever they would be. But uh, I mean, there is no merit to the case. I, I, haven't, I haven't maligned anyone, certainly not the Polish nation. I haven't said anything about the Polish nation ever. In, in my writings, but uh, it's uh, uh, so the, the whole thing is, uh, is still alive, if you will. Mm. Uh, to some extent, it's also a proof that this law, as they as they formulate the need for it, was just uh, totally unnecessary. There was a provision on the law, on the books, uh, in which one can, the prosecutor can. Uh, uh, mm, put initiate an inquiry about uh, uh, about uh, 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 precisely sort of maligning the Polish nation. They don't need a new one, uh, just as it is formulated here. And of course, the pretense of uh, this law um, being one uh, that will prevent the usage of the term Polish extermination camps uh, this is total nonsense. Yeah. So. In just a minute, we'll uh, break for a reception to which everybody is invited, but maybe uh, by way of conclusion, I might invite you to reflect on the arc of your own life. Uh, you were born in Poland. Uh, you grew up under the communist regime. You fought against it. You came to the United States, were educated, lived here for some 40 years, had a distinguished career, spent a good portion of it studying your homeland, studying Poland in that sense had a kind of liminal position. Um, at home, but not at home. It was part of you, but you, were, you chose to stay at a distance. Now you've moved to Berlin. 
You're on the perch of the return. You peer into your homeland. I'm curious, what do you see there, and what do you see about your own journey in making your way almost back? Well, um, uh, I think I will take a fifth amendment on this. <laughs> this would ruin my relationships with a lot of people if I engage in it. So um, all I can say uh, that uh, what, uh, what's happening in Poland now is a, it's, it's, it's a very sad phenomenon uh, for me. And uh, it's, uh, I, I don't quite understand why this turn uh, has taken place. Frankly, uh, from uh, 1989, for the next 25 years or so, until, let's say, 2015, <laughs> Uh, when law and justice finally came to power. This was the best period in the history of Poland ever, for, from every point of view, really. From the point of view of uh, material progress, from the point of view of uh, finding a secure place in Europe in, uh, uh, in a location that's very dangerous, you know, between Germany and Russia. My God, this is really, you don't... <laughs> wish it on your enemies, really. <laughs> but, uh, but within the framework of European community, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, 25 years of, uh, of, of a very successful also political life where uh, various political parties would uh, turn power in, in succession, uh, including a successor party to the Communist Party, which for a while uh, was freely elected to power and then lost in elections and gave up this power. So this turn to authoritarianism and to a kind of a rabid rhetoric which uh, um, portrays uh, Poland as, uh, as, a, as, as a country that's been victimized. Um, again, this sort of specter of, uh, uh, of conflict with everybody around and with these looming conspiracies, if you will, and, and, and the, the, the drawing on the, the, the sentiment uh, um, of, of anti-Semitism, which, which already um, came up in, uh, in, in the first period of, uh, of, of rule of this Law and Justice Party in another form as a, as a sentiment directed against the refugees. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is a profoundly um, stunning and, and disappointing phenomenon. And to tell you the truth, I don't understand why. What what are the mechanisms here, uh, which uh, uh, which uh, underlie this process? Yeah. Well, uh, we will uh, have to ponder that further in further conversations. <laughs> Let me. Um, if I may first thank again John and Dina Leader for their generous support of tonight's program and the History Matters series. <clears throat> if you share with them the, the idea that history does indeed matter, please do support our work here at the Center for Jewish History. There are, I can assure you, ample opportunities to do so. And uh, last but not least, thank you to Dr. Jonathan Brandt and Professor Jan Gross.